The open sea, its mystery and beauty have always been irresistible. But when the ocean turns, it shows no mercy. Mayday! Mayday! This is the true story of five sailors shipwrecked in the Atlantic with no food and no water. We're gonna die! Every choice they make is life or death in these shark-infested seas. The brand new 58-foot luxury yacht Trashman surges through the Atlantic. Her owner made his millions in the rubbish business, and a hastily assembled crew who've never sailed together before are delivering the yacht to his home in Florida. The six-day voyage begins in Bar Harbor, Maine. The crew will sail 1,300 miles down the eastern seaboard of the United States to Fort Lauderdale. The most experienced sailor is Deborah Scaling Kiley. She's the first American woman to have completed the grueling Whitbread Around the World race. I love to sail because you're working with nature. There's another force and, and you become one with that force. And, I, and I'm a, a junkie for it. I'm an adrenaline junkie. Debbie has been hired for the run by the yacht skipper, John Lippoff. He was sort of that scraggly sailor look. He's running nicely now. Head back in land, hire some more crew, yeah? The first thing that I noticed about him Cheers. that I thought was kind of wild was that he liked to celebrate everything. He wanted to have a beer the minute I met him. Problemo, Debs. Problemo. He showed me his resume, and it was quite impressive. He had actually been on a boat called Black Knight, which was the committee boat for the America's Cup. And, and you know, to be the skipper of that boat, you, got, you can't be all bad. You've got to be a pretty good, pretty good boatman. Right? John's brought along his girlfriend, Meg Mooney. She's no sailor, just along for the ride and looking forward to parties, calm waters and sunshine. Weather facts is clear sailing all the way. Brad Kavanagh's the youngest crew member. He signed up because Debbie's on board. Now, why don't you go to sleep now? I'll take the next watch with John. Ask him to come up. Brad's a decent sailor, although he's not yet in Debbie's league. The trashman heads inshore to Annapolis, Maryland, to pick up the final member of the five-man crew, an English sailor who's a friend of Brad's. Debbie, this is Mark Adams. Hi. Debbie here did the last whip, Brad. Is that right? That's right. But no, your job was. <laughs> I didn't like his condescending, chauvinistic attitude. Every minute that his mouth was moving, he was saying stuff just to be outrageous and to get people going. That was his M.O. When we left Annapolis, I was in heaven. I was on the big version of my parents' boat with these nice new people heading to Fort Lauderdale and I couldn't have been happier. There's something about pushing off and being back on the ocean. Everybody was getting along and it was exciting. The first day is an easy sail. By nightfall, they're right on schedule. That night, the weather was beautiful. The boat was fun to steer. Um, it really just didn't get much better than it was right then. But this calm doesn't last long. A storm is gathering, and it's moving quickly towards them. Debbie! Wake up! Debbie! That was four hours? It's blowing a gale out there. Meg's falling. She's hurt, and we're taking on water. John! She's hurt real bad. Can you come take a look at her? Where the hell did this storm come from? 
Usually if it's a squall, it comes in and it blows through and it's over. But this was not a squall. This was something that was building momentum. I couldn't believe the conditions had deteriorated so much. Surfing down those waves, it was like a roller coaster. And it's like an elevator when it drops. This is why I got into sailing, Brad. Well, my mother sailed through a hurricane when I was in her belly, but I can honestly say that this kind of weather is not in my blood. Mark's up on deck, just woo, howling at the wind. And obviously, he's been drinking. Better help her, she fell on her back. Well, I'll take a look. Meg had gone up on deck, and when the boat fell and wiped out, her tether didn't keep her from falling. I was like, what was Meg doing on deck to begin with? She has no business out in this kind of weather. Debbie, leave it, just help her, okay? But don't Debbie, for once, would you just do what I say? She rolled over slightly, and you could see the bruising begin, and it was all through the kidney area. I could just tell she was in so much pain. I want to go home, John. Take me home. Okay, Ellie. I'll get some help. John discovered that he didn't have any charts to take him into this part of the coast. It was just one more little omen that things weren't great. It was that he wasn't prepared. This is a sailing vessel trash man calling Coast Guard. We urgently need a compass heading so we can head inshore. We have no chart. Over. Brad and I went up on deck to take our next watch, and it was wildly out of control. The winds were gusting 50 miles per hour, and Mark's up on deck, and he is just wild. Are you out of your mind? We're in a gale and you're hammered! You're a bigger idiot than I thought! Good walking! Still floating in the shape! The Coast Guard advised us that we should go to Wilmington, North Carolina. But when we altered course and headed into the coast, those waves just started smashing into the boat and impacting us. And it was like one of those amusement park rides that, you know, kind of jerks you up, but it wouldn't go over and jerks you up. The yacht's sails are ripped off in the storm, so John turns to the engine in a last-ditch attempt to power through the waves. The alarms all went off and the engine overheated. The engine was gone and that was the end of our ability to charge the batteries. We were quickly going to be running out of power to speak to anybody from off the vessel. Now we had no engine, no sail, and we were just floating out there in the ocean. Not knowing what else to do, John makes a decision the others find hard to take. He radios for help. Yes, we're running on emergency power. We need assistance immediately. We're in trouble, our engine is down, our sails are damaged. We need immediate rescue. Over! We need rescuing. I'd never been on a boat that had requested assistance, and it was really odd for me because it was like giving up. But John's big issue there was getting Meg off the boat. He had no right calling the ghost guard! He's a skipper, Mark! He called the shot! Don't forget that! He was angry. You know, he, he believes that a sailor should be self-reliant and only that, you know, only wusses would call the ghost guard. Uh-huh. Roger that. Two ships, Exxon, Huntington, and Gypsum King, four hours away. Since the two merchant vessels are the closest ships to the trash man, the Coast Guard requests that they head towards the yacht to assist. Help is at last on its way. It gave us this false sense of security, and I think that's probably the kiss of death. They will rendezvous. Roger that. Over. Come in, please, Coast Guard. This is Trashman. Are you still there? Over. Anybody there? Anybody there? Over. Anybody? Anybody? Powerless, the yacht is battered by the enormous waves. But after 12 hours on watch and with help on its way, Debbie and Brad decide to get some rest. 
I crawled in. I was so exhausted. I can hear Mark whooping it up and howling at the wind. Woo! There was that brief moment. I thought, God, we ought to be on deck. And then I thought, you know what? It's not my problem now. I got to get some sleep. But you really can't sleep in that situation. You can just try and, and rest. And, and having all that time on your hands, your mind can just take you all sorts of terrible, terrible places. I was lying there and feeling like the boat was going to break apart. Without sails or an engine, the yacht's almost impossible to steer. So Mark ties off the helm and heads down to sleep. Brad lies awake, ill at ease, as the situation begins to get much worse. One of these times we got to the top of one of, one of these waves and it crested and broke, like at the beach, like Hawaii Five O, And the boat fell off the top, you know, we were in free fall. And then we impacted against the window and the window just smashed out and the water just poured in. Jimmy! Jimmy! We gotta get out of here! Go, 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 let's get out of here! Go, go, go! Here's the boat sinking and we're scrambling to get to the deck and I hear John over here going, Mayday! Anybody! Mayday, Mayday! We're sinking! We're sinking! We're sunk! Anybody! And I get up on that deck, and it was just like a slow motion drink. I, I, I don't even know how to describe it. It was, it was just gray, and it was crazy, and it was tumultuous. And I look around, and there is nothing. And we're going down, and we're going down fast. You don't think about dying. You don't think about drowning. You don't think about anything. You think about getting away from this boat that is going under, and it's sinking in less than two minutes. It's just going down like a big rock. Mark frantically struggles to undo the pressurized canister holding the life raft and survival gear. Brad heads for the only other option, a tiny inflatable dinghy. But I swam after the dinghy, kicking off my sea boots and my foul weather bottoms, thinking, my dad's gonna kill me. I've just let his boots sink. And then thoughts of my mother and how horrified she was going to be and how sad that she when she learned that I had died there in the ocean. The canister inflates. And he's still holding on, and eventually he just lets go. The life raft has blown away, and we weren't going to find it in the middle of the night. You managed to get anything from the yacht! Nothing! We're dead! Inside that life raft was everything that we needed to live, to survive what we were going through. It had an emergency beaconing device, which a plane could have picked up on, it had water makers, to make fresh water from salt water. Food, fish hooks, mirrors, signaling devices. It had rations, flares, first aid equipment. Perhaps had a radio even with it. And in that rubber zodiac dinghy, we had absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. I'm so sorry you lost the life bro. Our chances for survival were zero. As the boat sank, Meg was within the rigging. Get away from me, yacht! And she just didn't have the sea savvy or the knowledge to, you know, watch the waves and then when the wave action was right, 
to swim out. So I knew if I didn't go back and get her, she'd die. We're all gathered around the rubber zodiac dinghy. And I remember watching Trash Man as the last little foot of her mast slipped under the water. And it was the most devastatingly lonely feeling that I've ever felt in my life. The Trash Man went down in less than a minute. You're all gonna die! by not contacting the Coast Guard. You know, we were now half an hour late for our radio call. They should have been on the way. The cavalry rushing in. All we needed to do was stay afloat and they'd find us. The next day, when the sun finally came up, the sky was overcast and gray. The air temperature being 40, we would definitely succumb to hypothermia. Let's get under the dinghy. Here's a shelter. I can't. No. I can't. We'll be out of the wind. Rather than flip the dinghy over, the crew get underneath it, where they'll be sheltered from the bitterly cold wind and rapid hypothermia. Oh, come on. Check on you. The sad thing was is that Meg just couldn't participate. I think it was too painful for her. But more than anything, Meg was very claustrophobic. Soon, the water begins to have its own chilling effect. Okay. We gotta get out of the water. It's cooling us down. Get, get in there. We devised a system where we positioned our bodies suspended by a line that we'd rigged. Lie down next to me. You too. Lie on top of us. By stacking ourselves like a bunch of fuel rods in a nuclear power plant or a bunch of logs in a fire, we were able to share our body heat and to keep ourselves warm. As the storm raged on, you could crawl up underneath the dinghy like that and it was so quiet and so peaceful it was so deceptive it was it was almost luring you once again into that amniotic state When John started talking about his heart pains, I knew immediately he was probably just hyperventilating because the air would get very thick under the Zodiac dinghy. Please, get him into the dinghy! The wind was like 40 degrees and it was blowing like 90 knots. And we decided we would flip the Zodiac dinghy over and we lift Meg in. I was horrified at her wounds. The wire in the rigging had cut almost all the way to the bone and she had huge gaping wounds on her legs. <laughs> it was heartbreaking. Just those wounds alone were a death sentence. It's too bloody cold out here. Let's turn it back over. We're gonna freeze to death. Look, man. You want to go back in the water and help yourself? There's a whole ocean out there! We hung there for a minute, and pretty soon he goes, quit kicking me. I'm not touching you! You did it again! Cut it out! What are you talking about? I'm not kicking you! Stop! Now! And I thought, you know what? I'm going to look in the water, and I'm going to see where his legs are, and I'm going to stay as far away from him as I can. 
and it was the most eerie sensation. And I noticed these like torpedo shaped bodies and I thought fish. And then all of a sudden one came really close and I realized it was like hundreds of sharks. They were everywhere. And just the minute we got in fins, just everywhere in the water, and I don't mean like two or three, I mean 10, 20, they were everywhere. I've never seen so many sharks in my life, not in my entire trip around the world. It was the most frightening feeling I've ever felt. To this day, I don't know why the sharks didn't attack us that night. With all of us treading water, with Meg's legs bleeding. Mark, I'm warning you! Do not ah! hit ah! a single shark with that! Are you out of your mind? What do you think, what? You're gonna calm them down? Give me that! Our biggest threat was not just the coal, but a wave breaking underneath us and flipping the Zodiac over and dumping us back into the shark infested water. So what we had to do is devise a system to try to slow the little rubber Zodiac down. Hey, Debbie, do you think maybe we can make a sea anchor out of this thing? Stabilize this tub? But as soon as we threw the piece of plywood over the front of the boat, the shark swam up and grabbed it in its mouth. These were not little sharks. And this one was big enough to pull a 13-foot rubber zodiac dinghy with five people in it, which is at least, what, 700 pounds, wildly through the water. By nightfall, the storms died down, but the sharks are still out there. The crew's hungry and thirsty, and the night air begins to freeze their wet bodies. It's night two, and with night comes just that threat of not being able to make it through the night again. A light! A light! A light! Oh God, it's close! Paddle! At first, when you see the light, you just are so excited you can't stand yourself. They're coming to rescue you. And then you realize the reality of the situation is it's pitch black. You're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and nobody can see anything. If I can't make eye contact with someone on that ship, I'm not close enough. And I just think that paddling towards it is a huge waste of my energy and I haven't eaten anything in two days. And I don't want to expend my energy when I'm freezing all the time to do this. The craving for water is like nothing I've ever felt. It's as if every cell in your body needs it and it's crying out for it. You haven't had water in 24 hours, you know, almost 48 hours. But all I got was the wind blowing through my mouth and actually drying my mouth and my tongue more than the moisture coming in from the rain. Damn! It was as if God was spitting on us, laughing at our situation. All of a sudden we remembered about the ship and we looked out and the ship was gone. Maybe that was a chance for survival. It, it's just, it's the ultimate despair. And at that point I just couldn't take it. I was, that just, I felt that I was being teased by the environment, by the powers that be. Oh, I stood up and I gave God the finger, started, you know, saying, what are you doing to us? If you're gonna make it rain, let it rain so we can get some water. The last thing you wanted to do is curse God because that was about the only chance we had for survival. <sighs> I don't wanna die. <sighs> the ship has gone but some unwanted guests refused to leave. There was always a fin somewhere. They were always bumping into the raft and pushing us around. 
Then they'd go away for a while, and just about the time you think that they'd gone away, they came back again. <laughs> the situation was going from bad to worse to nightmarish. Day three, and the crew of the trash man are still adrift in the Atlantic, suffering from dehydration, infection, and the fear that they'll never be found. Well, we were starting to get very frustrated with the Coast Guard because without food and water, we were really starting to suffer. Hey, do you think a ship will rescue us before the Coast Guard finds us? Coast Guard's on its way. Yeah, sure, of course. Coast Guard's on its way. Hey, guys, I got news for you. The Coast Guard ain't coming. <laughs> they never were. They forgot about us. We're on our own. Thanks a lot, Debbie. <laughs> it was as if I had dropped the final curtain on the show. They just all kind of sat back and looked at me like I'd lost my mind. Hey, Brad, where do you think we are? <sighs> well, from roughly where we went down, we're anywhere between 35 and 135 miles off the coast. What? Is that far? We could still be blown to shore, right? Guys? <laughs> my God. The crew have no idea where they are, but the dinghy's now 140 miles from shore and heading out into the Atlantic. The dynamics of the group begin to change, and partnerships form as the survival instinct starts to take hold. What are we gonna do? I don't know. I'm so sorry I cut you into this. If I didn't have you, if it was just me and those guys, I don't know. We just need to stick together. You and me. If we lose this bond, then we're lost. And it's what's gonna keep both of us alive. So I'm gonna watch out for you, and you watch out for me. I can hardly stay awake. Why don't you go to sleep? I'll watch you. Make sure you're okay. If it had come down to uh, someone trying to hurt Brad or kill him, I would have been done my best to take him out because Brad was my partner in survival, and I wasn't going to let him go. There was no way. The bottom of the boat was fetid. It had a mixture of urine and blood and pus. We were in absolute agony because we were starting to get massive staph infections all over our bodies. These staphylococcal infections are caused by bacteria entering cuts in the skin. They can soon attack the heart and lungs, and Meg is at particular risk because of her open wound. I felt so bad. She was dying of blood poisoning, and we were sitting there watching Meg die. It was, it was just tragic. Night three, with all the infection coming on, and, we, and the starvation setting in, we all were getting very delirious. doing? That stuff will kill you! Here, Miss Wingrat. Help yourself. Everyone knows that you're not supposed to drink seawater. They tell us that from the time we're little kids, and that's one of the things you just don't do. Drinking salt water dehydrates your body even more, and it causes kidneys to shut down, and you begin to have delusions. And, and ultimately, if you drink salt water, it will kill you if you don't kill yourself first from the delusions. I didn't really know how long it would be before we saw the effects of the salt water, but I, it stood to reason to me that 
it would be probably, you know, seven hours or so. And I was right. It didn't take all that long. <laughs> it's too hot. It was just like I was watching some crazy play. I love my facts! Wait. Do I see land? I see land! I see land! It's right there, man. You see, it's right there in front of us. We just all found this, Meg. We go to the hospital where my mom works. She'll take care of us. We're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. We're nowhere near Falmouth. That's total crap, man! It's over there. This went on all day long. Oh, I want my cigarettes. I need one now. The monotony of it was starting to drive me crazy. I'm just gonna get my car. We're in the middle of nowhere. You guys bring the boat in, and I'll go get the car. There is no car, John. There it is. I see it. I'm just gonna get the car. And then all of a sudden, he jumps off the side of the boat. John. And we're like, where the f are you going? There is no land, there is no Falmouth, and there are a lot of sharks out there. You need to come back. Get back in the boat, John. John, go back in the boat. Go back in the boat, John. He's going to Brad, do something. I can't. I just... I don't have the energy, Debbie. Look how far away he is. There's just physically not enough strength in me to force him not to go. I can't see him. All of a sudden, we just hear this shrill scream. <laughs> I mean, blood curdling. And it was over. And then silence. And it was like there was no crying. There was no nothing. Meg just said, he's gone. There wasn't any doubt what had happened to him. The sharks got him. The sharks never left. I was angry with him because I really felt that I would get a lot of credit for surviving and having everyone survive. I, I looked forward and relished the thought of being heroic. And uh, there's nothing heroic in what I had done in this instance, which was stand by while John swam off to meet the shark. The four remaining survivors of the trash man cling to life as they drift helplessly in the Atlantic. The sharks have just claimed their first victim, John the captain. After John went over, we all just sort of sat back for a while. I think everyone was so shocked. And Meg was crying, but she wasn't sobbing. She was so sad. And she was so sick. Are you gorgeous? I know how to make you feel better. Take your mind off, John. He says, Hey, lady, I think it's about time you and me had sex. And that just 
like hit me over the head with a two by four and I woke up Brad and Brad. We've got to stop this. Hey, it's just how yeah, she deals with it. <laughs> right. I'm tired of playing games. I'm just going back to the 7-Eleven to get some more beer and cigarettes. Mark, you're not going to the 7-Eleven for anything. You, you know we're in this dinghy, don't you? Oh. I'm just going over for a minute. Just to stretch my legs. And get rid of the cramps. Just for a moment. Brad and I get up and go, man, the sharks just ate John. No, no, no. Right back in. And just about that time, we feel this. Bam! And then we feel a bam again. And all of a sudden, we realize there's like this frenzied attack, and the sharks are eating Mark underneath the zodiac. Oh, sharks. It was, without a doubt, the most horrifying moment of my entire life. The sharks now had a taste of what they'd been following for days, and they wanted, they wanted more. So they tried to tip the boat over with Meg, Debbie, and I in the raft. What would it feel like? Once they had begin to drag you under, what would it feel like with that first bite? And maybe it would be better if we jumped over and drowned ourselves so we would never have to feel it. And it lasted for what seemed like an eternity, like hours. That night, I remember waking up and looking up and there were stars everywhere. It was like a starry night. And then I began to hear Meg moan in the dinghy. I think she was frustrated and she just wanted to strike out at somebody. I mean, John really did her a dirty trick, leaving her there in the raft. It was really weird. She took her hands and started moving them in the air like a Spanish dancer, like she was in completely some other world. And then, out of the blue, she just started talking. Yeah. <laughs> And it all of a sudden became very clear to me that Meg was speaking in tongues. She's dying, isn't she? She was she was dying. She was really close to death. When we woke up, Meg was dead in the bottom of the dinghy. All that fetid mixture that was left over from the seaweed and the urine and the pus and... Debbie. Should we eat her? We were starving and you've heard of cannibalism at sea, and are we gonna, you know, nourish ourselves by, by somehow figuring out how to butcher her and eat her, or, or, or what are we going to do? Ugh. She's too infected, Brad. We have to get rid of her. I'm so hungry. 
hungry. My stomach's twisting in pain. You're right. And so we decided that we would take off her shirt and all of her jewelry so that we could uh, give those to her family. I got really mad at Brad because he was like, I can't get the ring off. I'm like, get it off. It's not like you're gonna hurt her. Just take it off and get it off. <laughs> It was such a sad moment because we laid her body, naked body, on the side of the raft, and um, and then we um, decided that we couldn't just push her over; that we had to give some kind of a funeral. And so we said the Lord's Prayer and Psalm 23, and then we just gently pushed her body overboard. And we decided then that we would just go back to sleep so that if the sharks attacked her, we wouldn't have to see it. And so that's what we did. People can argue that it was a physical thing that killed Meg, but I think it was John abandoning her and making her despair that killed Meg. I've been watching ever since I woke up. <laughs> the water in the bottom. Meg's died in it. It's making you ill. The sun's yeah. only making it worse. We gotta wash the dinghy out. Be careful, I don't have the energy. Yes, you do. <laughs> We're turning this thing over right now. What about the sharks? I haven't seen sharks for hours. Yeah. Come on, Brad. Don't give up on me. And it really scared me because I did not want to have to live in that life raft, in that little rubber zodiac dinghy, alone. I gave it a few good pops and I almost got the boat over and then I lost my grip on the line and I fell over the side of the boat. Ah! 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 And this time, I don't have the strength to get myself back into the boat. For God's sake! I sobbed. I felt like I had just doomed Brad to death. If the shark showed up, we were screwed. And I just went on and I just burst into tears and I fell back against the seat and I just, I couldn't do it. I could give a crap about what Debbie's thinking this time. She's just sitting there being completely useless and I'm still alive and she won't help me climb in the raft. For God's sake. She's finding it impossible to help me to climb into the raft. And I don't know what's on her mind, but she's not thinking straight. It was life and death, and I pulled myself into the boat while she sat three feet away from me just crying. We were each at one end or the other of the raft. He wouldn't talk to me. He was so off at me. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Brad. I just want to relax because of all this death that's been happening for the past uh, 12, 15 hours. And as soon as I take a break, I look at the horizon and there's a ship coming straight at us. Debbie. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm gonna make it up to you. Let's catch fish. <laughs> We're going to survive. Daddy, there's your ship. I had heard it was a ship so many times. I just didn't, it, big deal. It's a ship. They're not gonna see us. Turn around. Look how close it is. And I turned around and it was amazing. And the ship came by and it went by and a guy walked out on the wing bridge and looked down at us and I looked at him and he looked at me and I waved at him and he waved at me and next thing I knew there wasn't just one person that came out but there were like five, six people. They were all coming out. They threw all their life-saving equipment out at us. And Debbie jumps off the boat and I'm like, God damn it. You know, don't leave your friend Brad here all alone. What? No goodbyes? Nothing? I was holding the rope that held the life ring, and they started winching us in. And then a big sailor picked us both up. And when they finally hand me off to the last guy, he just gently lays me on the deck. And I realized that, that they were Russian. And I didn't care. It was, I, I didn't care where I was going. I didn't care who these people were. I was lying there and Brad was there and we were alive. These guys did a fantastic job getting us on board the vessel, and oh, it was just so great. I mean, the whole thing was just so great. That was just wonderful. And then, you know, but it was just the start of our, of our journey back to life. There's never a day that you're more thankful for life than the day you almost die. I'm here today, and I don't feel guilty about it, and I have no regrets. <laughs> and every day I wake up, and it's a new day, and I'm happy. And I always, always try to find something good in the bad things that happen to me. It's not something you just turn off when it's over. You keep. You know, you keep living in that survival mode. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you're shell-shocked or what you are, but it's impossible to just turn it off and go back to being the way you were before. In their five days at sea, the dinghy had drifted 140 miles from where the yacht sank and was heading further and further away from land. With no beacon on the dinghy, the two merchant ships were unable to find it. The Coast Guard called off the search for Trashman because it received a call stating the yacht had made it safely into port during the storm. Who made that phone call remains a mystery. I believe that, you know, John and Mark could have pulled through, but I think with these guys, the real problem was that they had just reached the end of their rope and it was not worth it for them to put up with the pain and continue living. But for me, I'm not going to take myself out of the game before it's over. Brad and Debbie have no idea how much longer they could have hung on. What they do know is they had an unshakable will to survive. <laughs>